Psalms 25, a Psalm of David. Now what David, this Psalm is going to do, he's going to make a request to God. And God wants to hear our request. God wants us to pray. Paul says, you know, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. Jesus says, ask, seek, and knock. Ask anything in his name. The Holy Spirit asks God, makes pleads for us. Jesus prayed for us. Jesus prayed and sought the Father, often in the public ministry. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. And that's the eternal part of us. That's the part of us when, when we die, we go to heaven or we go to hell. That's the part of us that lives forever. Now, outside the rapture, if a Christian dies, his body goes into a grave, it's dead. His soul goes off to glory, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Oh. <coughs> Excuse me, I have allergies. A lost man, his soul goes off into hell. His body goes into the grave. And for a saved or lost man, our spirit goes back to God because it belongs to God, whether we believe God or we don't believe in God. So David's saying, that eternal part of me, I give it to you, Lord. I lift it up to you. And here's the expression, not to be taken lightly. Oh, my God. Now, this is not an oh, my God, in the air, uh, you know, terror, judgment, or trouble. This is, oh, my God, how great you are. I trust in thee. So, David expresses to God. And this expression, oh my God, is 458 times. 396 verses in the Old Testament and 36 verses of the New Testament. And it's never OMG. And it's a title of respect for God. Troubles, problems, oh my God, help me. And it's also, oh my God, how great you are as is here. I trust in thee. I trust in thee. And we read before a couple of Psalms in the back. It says, some trust in horses, some trust in chariots. And then we see some Christians trust in guns. Some trust in Republicans. Some trust in, in Democrats. And some plus trust in the American democracy. Some are against socialism. I say, oh my God, I trust in thee, God. I mean, oh, I open up, here I go, open up a can of fish. I like, put the lid on it. If you are saying, hey, I'm going to go buy a gun and I'm going to kill somebody if I have to, is not murder planning out the murders to kill somebody? Well, they told Jesus after, after the Lord's Supper, hey, you know, there's two swords. He said, that's, that's enough. Peter used one of the swords. He said, Peter, put that sword away. Paul tells us he was amongst thieves. Paul never told us he used a weapon. Fox Book of Martyrs, you very rarely read about people who use weapons, and that's off the wall. We'll go back. We'll get off the deer and rabbit shooting. I trust indeed. That's where I got off. <laughs> now look at him. Let me not be ashamed. All right, God, I trust you, but I don't want to be made ashamed. See, God, people know I love you. People know I I'm serving you. People know I trust you. So don't put me in shame. Let them be ashamed, which transgress without a cause. They just sin because they're sinners for all have sinned. And David's saying, listen, Lord, do me good all my life so people can say, hey, look how wonderful his God is. And we got to break out of that comfort zone where God's got to give us troubles, trials, and tribulations because God loves us. We got to be chastised because God loves us and we have done wrong. And yet the world may look at, oh, what kind of God you got. And yet our Father's love for us is, hey, I'm the strength you. I'm trying to make you better. They may not see it. 
But God knows what he's doing. And I know what David's saying. He's saying, God, you're almighty, you're great. Don't ruin your testimony. But who cares what they think? It's what God is doing in our life. And you go back and read the entire book of Job. And he has three friends just rag on him and tag him. And they're just ranking on God. And, and in the end, God's like, you know, you guys were idiots. You didn't say what was right. And Job, you had a problem too. But in the end result of God doing and allowing the devil and God to work in Job's life, Job got right. Job got his family back. Who would have ever thought that Job would see the resurrection of his children? And then God was praised. So sometimes we got to be made ashamed because our openness to sins or our openness to iniquity and God has to rebuke us. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Me first, others next. Oh, you know, joy, Jesus first, others next. In yourself last. Yeah, all the time in your life, bull. Even Stephen said, let's go over to Acts chapter 7. Let's, let's look at the great Stephen. Let's see what Stephen did when he had his trial. In chapter 7, let's see the great Stephen, David. <laughs> And look at Acts seven fifty nine, and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God. Oh, that's great! That's what David's doing, saying, "Lord Jesus, receive my spirit." And then verse sixty, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. You know what Stephen's thinking of? Himself. You know what David's thinking of? Himself. You know what we think of? Ourself. You know what Job was thinking of? Himself. You know what Jesus was thinking of? Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. You know, Jesus first, others uh, next, and you. So that sounds great, but... Really? Do you really practice that? If we were to take your your prayers that God has recorded, and let's see how many of them prayers that you prayed were for you and your family and your people and, and your prayers for others. How many pronouns of I, me, myself, and me would be in your prayers? I wonder. So don't go running off, oh, I'd be, you know, others first. Even David and even Stephen, it was me first. And the first sin of our own lives are me first. That's why you get upset at, at the line at the grocery store. That's why you get upset sitting at the, at the uh, uh, waiting room, the doctor's office. That's why you get sit, upset that they're not taking you right away at the emergency room. That's why you get upset when you get to the red light, because me. These people do not deserve to be in front of me. I got to go first. That's me first and others. Let them be ashamed that transgress without a cause. That would be the enemies. You know, not really good. Jesus comes along and says, "A new, you're to love the brethren and you're to love others." Paul says, "Listen, if you got two Christians and you're not to go to court, have a case against Christians, which happens all the time." Paul says, "Hey, you know what? Let's say, you know what? I just suffered a loss in the name of Christ. We're not going to go. I, I, I just suffered a loss. We can't find an end to that. We can't get it right." You're not going to find that today. No way. Not the me, myself, and I attitude, especially amongst the churches today. Now, when I try to find pictures for 
the titles of these messages I do, I will look for the pictures on Google. There's a thing that says, you know, I can publicly use the thing. Sometimes I don't do that. Sometimes I'll use, you know, there, there's no restrictions. And I'll see a picture I like and I'll see, oh, this belongs to a, I'm going to say a religion, Christian or whatever it is. I'll look at that, that www.christian, religion, whatever it is. I say, I can't use that. And I'd be like, well, why? Because those would be the ones that would sue me over a corporation using their picture. A religious group would be more entitled to sue you than a corporation ungodly unsaved. And it's happened over and over. You've had court battles between half the congregation of the church and the other half of the congregation of the church. And Paul says, no. We're supposed to look at our enemies. Again, I mentioned a gun. Oh, no, I took a gun. I'll shoot him. And that guy's lost. And then you send him off into hell for all eternity. That. Yeah, you got rights. You got the right. You got the right to die and the right to go to hell. Thank God for God's mercy and God's grace. Are you against? I ain't against guns. If you want, you want to own one, go ahead. I don't just, just showing you a little reality. Jesus says you're supposed to love your enemies. You're supposed to seek goodness upon their heads of, of kindness of goodness. Which gets them angrier. If there's one enemy of the Bible, if there's one enemy of Christians, here we go. Ready? It's the Jewish people. You better not dare do anything against a Jewish person, no matter what he does against you, against Jesus, against the Bible. They are God's protected people. And God says, I will bless them that bless them. And I will curse you if you curse them, even if they are going against you. They have persecuted Paul left and right. And Paul says, I pray for the peace in Jerusalem. I am going to witness to the Jewish people. One time he got mad at the Jewish people. He says, listen, that's it. I'm done with you. I'm going to Gentiles. He still went to the Jewish people. You know that man, the Jewish person, he comes and you shoot him. Oh. Just trying to help you out. Just put your trust in God. I don't know. We live, the, we live in a messed up world. Put your trust in God. So he says, show me thy ways. Jesus said, I am the way. The law shows David without, there's no Jesus. In David's time. So instead of Jesus, David has the laws. And they're written by Moses. And they're Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And he has Joshua. Judges. I'm not sure he has Ruth of his, his grandparents. And God says, okay, David. You got trouble? You got a problem? Go to the priest, the Levites. And ask him. And David did that many times. One time he, he calls upon the, the Urim and Thurim. Other times he calls upon the priest. He calls upon God. To get what he's supposed, supposed to do. Today we go to the Bible. 66 books of the Bible. And we say, what does the Bible say? We are to study the word of God. And we are to rightly divide. I mean, if I want to build an ark in America, I know that's not today because there's nothing about a Gentile building an ark. You say, well, what is that ark? Cash, check, or money order. You know how much money you could have sent off to, to missionaries overseas? You know how much money that could have gone off into India where there's great revivals and great people who want gospel tracts and people who want actually Bibles in China and if you can get them under the underground and you can get them in other nations and get the word of God, pay for missionaries in Israel? Hmm. 
show me thy ways, O Lord, the Bible. The Bible doesn't say build an ark today. That's way back in the Old, old, old Testament. The Bible says today for Christians, go in all the world and preach the gospel. Teach me thy paths. Again, the law showed the Jews what God expected to them. Today, we have the Bible complete to show us. There are things in the law we're not saved by the law, but there are good things in the law to say, you know what, I better not do that because if it did not please God then, it sure does not please me now. And I've had countless people, I've witnessed to them, you know, if you... If you're to die, do you know you're going to heaven? Do you know Jesus Christ? And several forms like that. And I've had many people go up to me, you know, you see that? Yeah, what is it? That's a tattoo. There's my religion right there. There's my proof I'm going to heaven. Well, you're going to get a brand new body. You won't have that tattoo. Only ones that marked in heaven is Jesus on his hands and feet in his side. Well, is, is tattoos wrong? God told the Jew not to make any marks upon him. And he represents that for the dead. Well, you know, I didn't get, what's the most number one tattoo ever to get around? A skull. Snakes. The image of death and the devil. Well, I've got mine with a cross. And I've got mine, you know, with a dove. The Bible says like a dove. Not a dove. You got it wrong. Well, I got the cross. It's not the cross that saves. It's the one that died on the cross. I got the rainbow. Read Genesis. It wasn't a rainbow. It was a bow. The only rainbow in the Bible that's associated with God, it's green. It's around the throne in Revelation if you study and rightly divide the word of God. Now, things like, you know, build a battlement around your house. Well, if you got people that go up in your house and, and sit up there and, you know, look at the sun and look. All right, then I put something around my house for protection. But other than that, I really don't need to do that. But that's not my salvation. Uh, when we look at Paul, we looked at the Ten Commandments. We did not see the Sabbath. There is no Sabbath for the Christian. And yet we have one day prescribed for God the first day of the week. And we perfectly right in the Old Testament not to commit adultery. We saw adultery was, was forbidden before the law. We see adultery forbidden during the law. We see adultery during the church age. It's wrong. We can't completely excuse the law as, hey, God didn't like it then. He's not going to like it now. But my salvation today rests upon Jesus Christ, not what I can do. And we do find the law in the church age epistles. Not for salvation, but for a good conduct. You know, thou shalt uh, not covet thy neighbor's good. It'd be good, to, a good testimony as a neighbor to your neighbors in your neighborhood. You know, that guy is always, moder you know, he's always looking for my lawnmower. He, he, if my lawnmower ever got stolen, I think he would be he them still. That's not a good testimony. The Bible says to the Christian, abstain from all appearance of evil. Don't even make it look like good. I'm not saying follow the law for salvation, but James writes that a Christian is to have works. Not to be saved, but works of a Christian. And that we can look, you know, that guy tries to do good, and he has a good testimony as a Christian. He has a good testimony being saved. He's respectable. And then as a church, eh, Paul said, we're not to steal. We're not to deceive. We're, John tells us we're to love one another. That's the paths. Lead me, lead me in thy truth. And again, for, the, for today, that truth is Jesus. The life is Jesus. Teach me. So when David says, show me the ways, Teach me the past. Lead me in the truth. Teach me. It does not come natural. Titus, Paul writes to Titus, have the, younger, have the women teach the younger women how to love their husband and love their children. And he writes to the Ephesians and says, husbands, love your wives. You got to be told because it doesn't come natural. Why? Because we want to think of ourselves. 
And at one point, Paul wrote to the church, he says, husband, as you love yourself and you dress yourself up and you make yourself look good and you fix yourself in the mirror and you make yourself presentable, you're also to do that with your wife. Also, husband would be just me, all about me. Honey, you do everything for me. And Oh, I'm supposed to do something for you? We just ran into the big me, myself, and I again. We have to be taught. Oh, I don't need to go to church. If there is a proper King James Bible-believing church, and it will have problems, they all do, but if there's one in your area, you go to church not for salvation, but you go to church and learn how to be a Christian. And you humble yourself before a man of God that God has put before on that pulpit and you let God work in you and you let you, God say, hey, you know what? That message is about you, idiot. And you repent or you do right. You advance yourself. You grow yourself. And to be bigger and better Christian by the word of God, or you repent and you get yourself right with God because you're failing. That's showing, that's teaching, that's leading, and again, that's teaching. A Bible-believing church is to help you grow. That's what it's for. Again, it's not for salvation. And you got churches over the world, they're not Bible-believing church. They make me feel good. See to me again? How great I am. No, the hymn is how great thou art. Talk about God, not you. Listen, I've been saved 1987. I've done jail ministries. I've done Sunday schools. I, I had Bible studies. I, I've been in the prisons. I didn't say that already. I preach on the streets and I sit before a pastor with a King James Bible. And there, there, there are times in the Sunday morning, in the Sunday night, in the Wednesday night, I'm in my seat, I am seated and I am praying to God saying, God, he said, I sin. I need to repent. Or God, he said, I need to do that. I'm not doing it or I'm not doing it enough. And I'll be reading my Bible and say, Lord God, I've sinned. Or Lord God, I need to do. Lord, I need to grow. And there are people who sit home, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna advance myself. You're not gonna, because you're not gonna yell at yourself. You're not gonna scold yourself. You're not gonna chastise yourself as much as a preacher under God and God using the scriptures. Now, if you don't have a Bible-believing church, there is none in your area, and I know that is so today, or you live in a country where it's forbidden. You try to get CDs from a good preacher. Try to get something and let God use that. I understand that you can't be always in church Sunday morning. But if you can, and you're not, well, there's a problem. My family and I, I've always believed, this is this is from my wife, Lisa, if any of us are sick and it can be caught to other people, we don't go. Because we don't want to give it to anybody else. That's a complete, that's a belief, that's not a steadfast belief. I don't think it'd be wood, hay, and stubble. You know, we're not going to church because, you know, I passed it on to my child. Or he passed it on to, to the spouse. Uh, we may pass, I don't think God's going to, okay, you know, that's wood, hay, and stubble. You didn't go because you got something you can give to other people. But that, that's, a, that's a very good excuse. You don't want to get others sick. But if you just don't go because you're too tired, you don't feel well, uh, you know, because you were up all night, whatever that, and you don't go because you just don't feel like going, you deserve a day. That's not an excuse. You can't. Because you can't, okay. But if you can and you don't, A church is not a means of salvation. It's a means of growth after you're saved. And it can show a lost man how to get saved. But it's not for a lost man to say, hey, God, I went to church. Yes, yeah, so who cares? The church wasn't nailed on the cross for you. So you got to show, to teach, to lead, and to teach. For thou art the God of my salvation. There it is. 
It's not a church of salvation. It's not a religion of salvation. It's not a works of salvation. It's the God of my salvation. And who is the salvation today? It's Jesus Christ. So guess who God is? God is Jesus, and Jesus is God, Mr. Jehovah Witness. And God, according to Acts 20, 28, shed his blood. Well, who shed his blood? Jesus. I even stumped the Jehovah Witness. He made him even think there for a moment. Because his New World Translation didn't change Acts 20, 28. There's no time that God himself, outside of Jesus Christ, ever shed his blood for mankind, except it be Je Jesus Christ. My salvation is not my salvation. And if I witness to somebody and they get saved, it is not me that saved them. It is God using me. John the Baptist says, I'm a voice. That's all I am. I'm a voice. And you hear people all the time, I got three people saved this weekend. You didn't do nothing. You didn't save them. On thee do I wait all the day. <laughs> you know what God makes you do if you're impatient? He makes you wait. I know I'm impatient. That's one of my sins. You know what God does? Makes you wait. God, I'm praying right now for a couple prayers right now. Come on, God, do it. God's like, you gotta wait. Come on, God. No, wait. Come on, God, I'll put you in a handlock. <laughs> yeah, right. How about if I send you a little trouble? Oh, no. God is long-suffering. God is patient. God has no impatience in him at all. That's why he's holy and righteous. Now, I don't know. I, I, Me, I said I'm impatient. That's one of my sins. I think maybe everybody has a little impatience. I don't know. Maybe. Remember. Oh, Lord. Like God has a bad memory. <laughs> like I, oh, I forgot. Thank you for telling me, Dave. But you know, God does have a bad memory. <gasps> Sacrilegious. Go to hell for that. No, he does have a bad memory. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all righteousness. There's one thing that God cannot ever remember. Our sins under the blood. Don't ever ask God to remember your sins. And we do it all the time. God, remember that sin I did back then? God's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you know, back then, God. Remember the back then? I, I, remember before I got saved? Remember those sins? And God's like, no, no. Remember that sin I did last week? I, you know, I heard you in church the other day repenting of sins. I don't remember even what sins you repented. I don't remember that sin. That's how great God is. Can God do anything? Yeah, he can He can do all kinds of things. There's things God can't do. He cannot remember the sins that are under the blood of Jesus Christ. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies. And that's kind of good because when Israel walked through the wilderness, there were times that if Moses didn't stand the gap, Israel would have been smoking. <laughs> Israel would have been just dead dust. And Moses stepped in, God, calm down. Imagine Moses telling God, come on, repent now. <laughs> They're your people. And God would say, you know, Moses, you led those people out. And God, and Moses would be like, no, Lord, you led your people out. <laughs> Moses was bold <laughs> because he loved them people, as any pastor should be. If you got a pastor that loves you and stood up like Moses, they'd say, Lord, you know, that family's getting a little too much. I'm just dust myself, but, you know, they love you, but, you know, we're all sinners, Lord, remember? <laughs> remember, Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness. That's why we had the Holy Spirit and, and Jesus praying to it, because God is holy. And I believe there are times with, with Christians, I believe, with, with the children of Israel in the wilderness, God's like, I'm, I'm going to kill them. I'm, I'm done. Son's like, Father, he's our child. He's under the blood. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit's making bronies and intercessions that we can't even. That's the love and tender, tender tenderness of God the Father and the Godhead. I guarantee God says, be holy for I'm holy. When we're not holy, God's like, bring down the hammer. 
And yet the Bible says he's long suffering, not willing that any should perish. God, you know, all the Christians and Jesus, are like, come on, let's get the bride. Let's call the raptures. Like, Father's like, no, we got more people who are going to get saved. I know it. I have the foreknowledge. They just haven't got saved yet. No, not yet. Wait. That's the patience of God. I mean, had the rapture happened and answered a prayer to somebody on April 15th of 1987, I would have been lost and going to hell as we go through the tribulation period in the millennium. I would save April 21st, 1987. I said, Lord God, you know, I got so many troubles. I got so many problems. Lord God, call the rapture down now. I got troubles. I got problems. And the Lord's like, well, February 3rd, I know someone over here in this country, they're going to be witness to, and they're going to call upon Jesus Christ as their Savior, and the angels are going to rejoice in heaven. If I have that rapture happen right now, they're going to miss out. Now, stop being impatient and let me do my, I know, listen, I want you to pray for the rapture. I want you to look for Jesus. I told you that. But have a little patience. I want a new name written in glory. In order for that new name to be written in glory, I got to hold off the rapture a little longer. And I have a date for it. I know when it is. You keep looking. You keep praying, but just be patient. That, that's what it is. For they have been ever of old. How old is the mercy? And how old is the loving kindness of God? Adam, what'd you do? She did it. Eve, what'd you do? The snake did it. Really? Love and mercy. You know what God didn't do that in Genesis 3? You're all dead. Go to hell. Now the devil went to, going to go to hell. You know what the love and mercy is? All right. You guys are cursed with a curse. All creation's cursed with a curse. But come here. Come here. Bring me a lamb. I want you two to watch this. I'm going to slay that lamb. I'm going to put that, that lamb, that sheep clothes on you too. I'm going to clothe your na nakedness. That's love and mercy that he did not fry and send Adam and Eve off into hell that morning or afternoon. They, well, actually, afternoon, he said in the heat of the day. You know what the love and mercy is? Cain, where's your brother? Yeah, I'm not my brother's keeper. Who do you think you are? Took his offering, but didn't take mine. Bah! Cain, you killed your brother. His blood calls out. Yeah, so what? God did not. <clears throat> you're dead. God not prescribed that a murderer shall be put to death. Not yet. It's okay, Cain. I'm going to mark you. You're a, you're a fugitive from the vagabond. I'm going to give you opportunity to repent. He never did, as far as we know. You know that man that distracts you, that man that, that, that prevents you, that man that hates you for being a Christian, that man that hates you witnessing, that man that hates you with the Bible, that man that, that just hates Jesus Christ? He is still living because God says, here's one more opportunity for you to get saved. I'm long-suffering. You hate me, but I love you enough. I want you to get right. I want you to repent. I want you to get your name written down to glory. That's the long suffering of God. Remember again, not the sins of my youth. My sins of my youth for me, not David, since April 20, from the day I was born to April 21st, 1987, they're all under the blood. Now, I don't know how David was growing up. I don't know how young he was to bring his offering to the tabernacle. I know he was faithful as an adult, but there's not all the times he was faithful to bring that offering to the tabernacle because he couldn't because Saul would kill him. You ever think about that? When David was on the run, he couldn't show up at the tabernacle. If he did, Saul knew exactly where to go. Jesus wasn't like that. Jesus showed up every single time to all the feasts, all the times like he was supposed to, as the law was prescribed, and they, they didn't get him because it wasn't his time. There was one time, you know, he said, I'll, I, I, he's, he's, I forget how it put He goes, I'm not going right now. You know, the modern Bible's changed that. But he showed up later, as he was supposed to. 
Now, David couldn't all the time unless he put his life in the line. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. But I don't think he did because Saul was chasing him. But David had the sure mercies of David. David and, and Solomon, God says, you are my son. They are a type of Christians. They have been adopted and they are going to go to heaven despite what they've done, despite adultery and murder. The sure mercies of David. David says, Lord, you've been merciful to me. Don't even look at my sin. And when God looks at a born again Christian and you've been saved later than youth, a young adult, adult. An older person, elderly, your sins of your youth are all gone, forgotten. Lord, remember your tender mercies and your loving kindness, but Lord, don't remember my sins. And if your sins are under the blood of Jesus, no matter how old you are, God, don't remember them at all. You could have been 99 years of sinning. 365 days a year, 99 years of sinning. That moment you turn 100, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you, you have put your sins under the blood of Jesus. You have come to Calvary. You are now saved. You are adopted child of God. You have the Holy Spirit. 99 years of sins is under the blood. And every day you lived out after 99, if we confess our sins, even being saved, we still sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. I'm still a sinner. I, I repent. I read my Bible. I repent. I lie on my bed. I repent. I go to preaching. I, I repent when I am told of my sin. And yes, sometimes I repent of the sins I have already put under the blood. I'm a sinner. And the devil will bring up those sins. I'm not even going to talk. Just tell the devil it's under the blood. And tell God, God, I'm not sure if it's under the blood. If it's not under the blood, Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Then it's settled. Devil, it's under the blood. Remember not my sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, and it's the mercy of God, the mercy of Jesus Christ, that my sins are no more remembered. Remember thou me for the goodness sake. That's Jesus. O oh Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. That's Jesus. Therefore will he teach sinners the way. All right, go in all the world and preach the gospel. What's the gospel? That Jesus Christ suffered and died according to scriptures, was buried, and arose again the third day according to scriptures. That's what command. That's what Christians are commanded. What did Jesus say about this? He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. When we're going out there tell, telling the lost people the gospel only, God is using us to show them the way. What is the way? Jesus. And only Jesus. You're a voice. The meek will he guide in judgment. He'll never deal with the proud. You got to repent and get right of your proudness before he can deal with you. God will have to break you of pride to become meek. And the meek he will teach his way. Jesus. And how to live. How to do right. To be a Christian. To listen to that pastor. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. It, I'm saved? Yes, you are. Wow, you need to get baptized. Baptized? What's that? Well, see, after a man gets saved, after he believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, he, he's, and a baptism is a public demonstration to everyone, family, friends, and the church. It's not a means of salvation. It's just a public that you're dying to self, and you're going to be resurrected. You're going to be, show your new life. I need to do that. Well, it's not forced, but it is commanded that we do get baptized after salvation. But it's not a means of salvation. I need to do it. Yeah, okay. I'll do it. When? Next week. Be here. I'll do it. I need a King James Bible. Yes, you need a King James Bible. Okay. The Bible says, read and study and show thyself a pruder. I got to read the King James Bible? Yeah, I read Psalm. No, you read Genesis and Revelation. The whole thing? Yes, the whole thing. Okay, I've got to read the whole thing. I'm going to do it. Now you go tell people what happened to you. You go tell people about you. Tell them about you. Tell them, uh, yes. Okay. These are gospel tracts. What's the gospel? It tells people how to get saved. Oh, you hand them out free to people. Okay. You come to church. When the, when, when the church is here and you're available to be here, and when you absolutely can be here and there's no can't, and to learn and to grow and... Let God speak to you. Be in church? Yes. Okay. 
That's teaching the meek in a way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and true unto such as keep his covenant and his testimony. You want to walk the right path? It's mercy. It's true. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. And there's no other life but that of Jesus. For thy name's sake. Acts says, there is no other name given amongst men whereby we must be saved. Oh, Lord. Okay, here's this word I'm going to pick on. Pardon. I've been in jail ministry many years. Three, four, three or four prisons. I've dealt with prisons where minor offenses. I've dealt with prison. I dealt with a guy who murdered his landlord. A pardon can only be received if you are guilty. If you're not guilty, you can't get a pardon. So David's saying, oh, for thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon me because I am guilty my iniquity. How is my iniquity? It is great. I'm not a little sinner. I'm a great sinner, Jesus. Well, God. For us, it's Jesus. And by David saying, hey, listen, I got iniquity. He's saying, listen, I'm guilty. And, I, and as guilt, I need that pardon. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Some do, some don't. Him, the one that fears the Lord, shall he teach, is that teaching in the way, Jesus, today, and he shall, that he should choose. Choose life. All right, here's Jesus. Do you want him? Do you don't want him? All right, here's the King James Bible. You want a King James Bible? You want nonsense. You want a Bible believing church or do you want a church? You want a pastor? Or you want a pastorette? You want the law or do you want grace? And everything for people today, saved or lost, God said, what do you want? You want the right or do you want the wrong? So it's a choice. And as you grow as a Christian, God will come to you as you grow as a Christian. Do you want the right or do you want the wrong? And as you choose the right, you keep going, you keep going, you keep going until you choose the wrong. And then you stop. Then you become retarded. And I'm not saying anything against people who are retarded. I'm talking about Christians. Christians are retarded by choice because they told God, I want the wrong way. I've seen many Christians get retarded because they've chosen the wrong way. And that's a whole nother lesson, the wrong ways. His soul shall dwell at ease. Now it says soul, not the body. I told my pastor last night or this morning, there's events going on right now. I said, Pastor, I said, you know, I read things about saying, you know, uh, life is good. I said, life ain't good unless it's with Jesus. And I've got Jesus right now. And my life is woohoo, troubles. And all they that live godly shall suffer persecution. Paul told a church, have I become your enemy because I've told you the truth? Oh, see that, see that verse there? That is wrong. And it says soul. Didn't say the body. And because you get saved by Jesus Christ and you truly saved by the blood of Jesus Christ does not mean you're going to have prosperity. It does not mean life will be wonderful and great. A little sugar helps the medicine go down. No, a little sugar gives you more medicine because you get diabetes. Sugar kills. <laughs> sugar makes you sicker. It is salt that will take care of you. It's the soul that's at ease. What happens when I die as a Christian? Absent from the body. Here's my soul. And praise with, amen, glory to God. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more troubles, no more problems. Oh, one day you're going to wipe all my tears and no more I'm going to sin. I'm gonna, this soul is going to get a brand new body. Oh, it's great, 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 great. What's this body? Oh, Lord God, I got troubles. Oh, Lord God, I don't want to do this. Lord, I don't want to listen to you. Lord, I don't want the Bible. Lord, I want the Lord God help. Oh, Lord. What was David's life? Turmoil in the body. Everybody hated David, but God. David had trouble in his own family flesh. But his soul was at ease in the Lord. Don't you ever believe you got saved. Everything's going to be hunky-dory, wonderful, and great. Don't believe that. It's not true. 
And if you're going to live for the Lord, you're going to do right for the Lord. All they that live godly shall suffer persecution. You're not suffering as a Christian. You're not doing right. His seed children shall inherit the earth. That's a Jew. That is not a Christian. Only the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the descendants of Jacob are promised something of land that is the land grant given to the nation of Israel. That's why I say they get the new earth in the eternal life. You know what the Catholics are doing? Trying to do all these crusades and trying to battle all these lands, trying to conquer Jerusalem, trying to conquer all the world, send Christopher Columbus to kill all the Indians, get the gold, and go in all these fights and all these European nations, have all these, because they want the promise of the promise of the Jews. I want land. And we're the church of Jesus Christ. We're going to go out and conquer. No, that's not what us. I am not interested in a piece of land. I am interested in glory of Jesus Christ. I am interested in New Jerusalem. I ain't worried about any problem. Hey, listen, when I drop dead, if I own any land, go ahead and take it. it won't do me no good. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. Oh. Paul writes that those that have the spirit know. Those who don't have the spirit and don't know God don't know nothing. Religion does not know the secret of God. I do. Religion has, oh, it's 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 this. It's not that. They don't even open up the Bible to look. They don't even look. They go by tradition. They go by their own ways, their own words. I know things in the Bible because of Jesus Christ of salvation than a, a scholar of religion or a scholar of science or an educator or an evolutionist. I know more than an evolutionist because I believe in God, the creator. He will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord. It should be for anybody that's serving the Lord. He shall pluck my feet out of the net. You know who puts you in the net? The world. Even other Christians will put you in a net. Sorry to say, they will. God will say, come on, let's, let's get out of that. Let's do right. Turn thee unto me. God, look at me. God, help. God, me. God, I need help. God, look at me. Me, me, Stephen. Lord. I think even Paul did it a couple of times. Me. There it is. When you're put down to your own self, your nitty gritty, you know who you're going to look out for me, myself, and I. Me, look unto me and have mercy on me. For I am desolate and afflicted, suffering, troubles, problems. The troubles of my heart are enlarged, get bigger, more and more and more. You're serving the Lord, David. Those get better and better and better. Oh, bring thou me out of my distresses. David's king of Israel. Everything's great. No, he's got his whole family chasing him now. Look upon my affliction, my suffering, and my pain. And forgive all my sins. <laughs> you know, David's great. Maybe some of my sins and my troubles are caused because of my sins. And sins do have a part in affliction, pain, and for, and for God to forgive. Not all. Sometimes your sins. Sometimes it may be the devil. Sometimes it may be God. Consider my enemies, for they are many. Ow. They hate me with a cruel hatred. And that's the nation of Israel right there. Why do, does the world hate Israel? Because they're Israel. They're God's people. And they got all kinds of enemies. Oh, keep my soul. That's what you want. You want God to keep your soul. You want God to preserve your soul. You want your soul in possession of God forever. My soul is signed, sealed, and delivered to God. I'm not going to heaven. The Bible says I'm already seated in heavenly places. I haven't just got there yet. And deliver me. Let me not be ashamed. There's that shame again. For I put my trust in thee. When it comes to my soul, when it comes to the eternal life, the afterlife, God, it's you and nothing else. There's what he's saying. When his baby dies, he says, listen, that baby ain't coming back to me. I'm going to the baby. And we'll go to God together. 
let integrity and uprightness preserve me. God's integrity, God's uprightness. Preserve. You know what preserve is when you take something and, and you and you work it so it stays fresh and stay usable. If you take grapes and let them sit on the counter, after a month, two months, three months, they're gonna rot. They're gonna be raisins, and then they're gonna be good anymore. They'll get hard. When God takes those grapes, takes us, and he and he and he puts a little heat under them, and he and he stirs them. And he does something with them, and then he puts them in a the jar, and he seals that jar, and you can unseal that jar, you can use those preserves on toast, you can use that to preserves on, on, on good stuff. And you seal it back up, and you can keep it up. It lasts a whole lot longer. I wait on thee. There's our patience. And we read the life of David so far, and David, sometimes he's patient with God, and sometimes he's not patient with God. God, hear me. God, I know you hear me. God, answer me. God, I know you hear and answer me. God, I know you're helping me. Oh, God, I'm in trouble. Help. Don't laugh. That's us, too. Redeem Israel. There you go. God's people, oh, God, out of all his troubles. And that would be a reference to the tribulation and the troubles that Israel goes through life. The world hates. The devil hates. People hate Israel because they are God. It's that plain and simple.